picture or two. All right, get on the floor. Do you want to get up here and, and greet the crowd? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are kind of sort of getting started a little bit off schedule, but uh, we have a couple of opening acts, so to speak. Uh, before we begin, I just want to lay down some very, very basic ground rules. Uh, everybody, first of all, you see all these people that are serving you behind the bar. Uh, first of all, get drunk and be somebody. Second of all, tip them. Because we have to deal with them later. Second of all, be nice to the performers. We do enjoy a certain amount of... Uh, Feedback. Sort of feedback, interplay with the audience. At the same time, if you heckle us, you will be destroyed. I'm just telling you now. Uh, the third point, and this is one that's very important, you may notice the fact that there is a pool table over here that we have stacked our stuff on. Um, we've done that for two reasons. It's convenient. Second of all, if you actually attempt to play a game of pool while we're performing, I will harpoon your shit. So please just, we're here for a show, let's have some fun. So allow me to begin with my partner in crime, Miss Ann Myers, and she's going to lead us off this evening. All right. So if you like what you see tonight, please come by the Diamond on 16th. It's the old Diamond Bar on 16th on Saturday, where we'll be having another spoken word show along with the big dreaming event. So check out WeMustBeDreaming.com. So in all seriousness, first, I have an addiction, and I thought this is a great format to bring it out and talk about it. It started out just being casual Saturday mornings, you know, one of those weekend things, do it with friends. Then it, then it moved on to Saturday evening, then Sunday. Soon I was doing it every morning just to get by, then every day after work to cope. So now it's up to seven days a week. And it wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't so goddamn expensive. It's $120 an hour to get my fix. I don't know if you consider how big that is, but I do not make Charlie Sheen hookers and blow level of money, folks. So, what I need from you is your help. I need you to help me pay for this addiction. The great part about it is this $120 is enough for all of us. So please, contribute to KIOS and keep NPR on my radio. Thank you. And now to kick it off, to introduce you to this great organization, we have our local news anchor with the sultry voice, Michael Lyon. Thanks very much, Anne. Hello, everybody. Why well, it's strange to be in front of a microphone at this time of the day. <laughs> the pledge drive is over. Thank God for that. But you know, uh, <clears throat> our members came through for us three and a half days this time, and uh, and we're we're out and we made our goal, and that's fabulous. So we're we're already thinking about uh, the fall right now. But uh, thanks very much for everybody that's a listener and everybody that's uh, a member and uh, contributed. Uh, the great thing tonight about me standing here is that uh, I don't have to make any play. Um, I really don't intend to make any kind of a case for public radio. Uh, I'm here really just to uh, thank Evangelical Productions for um, bringing us here. Uh, Anne and Dave, and uh, I, I didn't, did you listen to Dave this morning on the radio? Wasn't he great? Yeah. 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 was great, I need the reassurance. <laughs> and I'm not working from a script tonight. Uh, if you're a regular listener, you know that sometimes I don't do very well even with a script. Especially, it is very early, especially uh, about four years ago, the news story, I finished off with a sports story, and I swear to God that I meant to say that the team pitched a five-hit shutout. <laughs> it was close, but not close enough. Somebody apparently called and complained. Uh, the only thing that's really kind of comparable is that my lovely wife, who was with me here tonight, came and played golf with me seven or eight years ago for the first time and was full of wonder at, at all of the things going on. And, and one of the things that she said was, honey, why does that man have titlice on his hat? <laughs> you golfers will know about that. 
I want to recognize also our wonderful staff that are here tonight. Uh, Cheryl Lee at the back. Our news anchor in the afternoon, membership goddess, Molly Nicklin. Our constant presence uh, and host, Mary Marchio. And of course, I get to uh, stand up here. But really, uh, this is, uh, as I said, it's not about us tonight, it's about you. Because with, without you, there would be no us. Without listeners, there's really no reason for a public radio station. Um, but uh, we're, for those of you that don't listen, we're at 91.5 FM. You can find us 24 hours a day, whether it's news from the BBC overnight, some of the great news and information programming that we have during the daytime, or maybe the uh, entertainment and music that we have for a variety of different tastes on the weekend. And of course, sort of pertinent to this night's event is that periodically as the programs become available, they're not uh, regularly available, the Moth Radio Hour, which plays yes. on new forums sometimes, an absolutely uh, awesome thing. I do want to mention also that it is about you, but it's also about the Omaha Public Schools because think what you will about education in this city. Uh, we're, it's possible for us to be here because OPS holds the license. They support us greatly. And one of the reasons why they support us is that at KIOS, you may not know, but we have a radio and television broadcasting lab for students. And believe it or not, we actually produce some talented folks who go on to careers in uh, broadcast and, and other types of journalism, which is really, really great. So, you know, the bottom line is, is this. It's about you and it's about this city, and I'd like to think that as part of this great city and this great community, we are a conduit and a voice uh, for what's happening, that people can tune in to some of our local programming uh, like on the mornings when we run our public service spots and we have those occasional interviews and can actually hear what's going on in the city and hear right from people. Uh, there are so many fabulous things going on and, and I think Evangelical Productions has really kind of broken the mold and is exploring new things and tonight I know will be absolutely great. So thanks so much for having us here. Thanks to uh, Evangelical for uh, making the donation tonight possible. We very much appreciate it and uh, have a great evening. simple. You want to get your teeth cleaned for free, you date a dentist. New addition to the house, you should screw an architect. But if you need somebody to talk dirty to you in bed, you better fuck a poet. Because, because the average civilian is going to hit you with something like, oh, we are really having sex. While a poet, a poet might phrase something like a little bit more like, well, my, my love muchness, my where, my why, my how, I want to do you like all three men in the blue man group because that's what color my balls are right now. <laughs> Sexy, but clearly it's just hypothetical because me, while I'm actually in the saddle, straight freestyling, in fact, afterwards, even when I review the videotape, Honestly, I can't make up half the shit I'm saying. And, and hey, I know you don't always want the dirty talk. That's great. Fuck a mime. <laughs> Have a knockout tongue, because that little creep is going to spend the entire day in his imaginary box, and he's never going to make it to your money spot. And you can call on me when you need the dirty talk. And that doesn't make you nasty, baby. It makes me nasty, baby. And clearly I'm okay with that. So are most poets, which is the point. 
Know thyself. If you can't stand firemen, don't light fires. If you can't stand a sofa in your swimming pool, never rent your house out to the samurai of spoken word. Yeah. And if after tonight, seeing a dope ass lineup of poets, spoken word artists could do to this mic, if you still can't fathom the imagery, ecstasy, eons and ions spun into speech for your actual spasms by a soul in a room with an immortal mouth gnashing loudly for true love over loneliness, moaning to the moon, the moon, the motherfucking moon. If you can't fathom that, don't fuck a poet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the page to the stage, samurai spoken word. Our host tonight, Dave Nesbitt. I am so, so grateful I don't have to follow him. <laughs> Ryan Lacey, ladies and gentlemen, you saw him open, you will see him close. He will be appearing, yeah, I think he'll be appearing at the tail end of the show, so um, hopefully you'll still be relatively conscious by then. Uh, but in the meantime, like I said, get drunk and be somebody. In the meantime, Will, you have to follow that. Uh, the gentleman who's coming up is Will Ross. Uh, we like to think of him as a writer. He prefers to think of himself as a professional troll. You can decide that after you check out his material. Will, come up and join us. That's right. I use a chair because I'm fucking lazy. All right. So, yeah, and I, I do consider myself a troll. They would call me a satirist, satirist, but uh, I would say that a satirist has to be vindicated by history first. So right now more I'm just kind of a dick. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're going to get started with uh, some Bobby Anderson. Now, uh, now, for those of you who don't know what Bobby Anderson is, uh, he's a character I sometimes do homework in the form of who has just severe ADHD. Uh, and about the worst family life you can imagine, but he's funny. This is his take home math test by Bobby Deathstrider Anderson. <laughs> Date, it's Friday because mom has passed out and Daryl is, is texting some random chick. Read each question carefully and answer in the space below. Please show your work. Thank you for asking nicely. Steve has twice as many apples as Sarah and Sarah has one third as many apples as Mark. Mark has 20 apples. How many apples do Steve and Sarah have? Way, way too many. First of all, who walks around with that many apples? I might carry two if I needed like one for the sake of redundancy, but that's about it. Seriously, who is this guy, Johnny Appleseed? Two. Chicago is 333 miles from Des Moines. A gallon of gas costs $3 and your automobile gets 25 miles to the gallon. How many gallons of gas would you need for a round trip? You're driving 666 miles? Who's driving, Lucifer? <laughs> Furthermore, my automobile, is that French for car? And if they lived in Iowa, why wouldn't they just stay in Chicago? <laughs> Daryl and my mom made us go through Iowa once when we were going to a gig for his stupid band, and there was nothing there but corn and windmills and farmhouses that looked like they were out of Night of the Living Dead. I refused to answer this one on the grounds that it was clearly written by the devil. Three, you have $100. Your friend Bill needs to borrow a third of it, and your friend Nancy needs to borrow a third of that. What do you have? $100 and two broke-ass friends? <laughs> Four, you're driving the speed limit of 60 miles per hour. <laughs> you booed the speed limit. When the speed limit drops by 25%, how fast are you driving now? Well, I only have my learner's permit, but I got Daryl's T-Bird up to almost 90 before Mom said she'd take my Xbox away if I didn't slow down and get in the right lane. <laughs> but I'd never drive under 70 on my own. Girls would laugh at me. So I guess the answer is 70 in either case, or more when I get a real license in a car with flames on the side. Five. Sue and Adam have been together for 12 years and plan to get married in one-third as many months as the years that they've been together. It is February. What month do they plan to marry in? What is their deal? Beside the fact that mom says they're already common law married, 12 years? Are they afraid of commitment? Put a ring on it, dude. As for Sue, you're not getting any younger. Sue should have a baby. Mom did that and now Daryl says he might as well stay since he's got to pay child support anyway if he leaves. 
Six, Erica's tea party has 12 guests less than Roger's tea party. Roger's tea party has 90% less guests than Florence's. Florence's tea party has 50 guests. How many guests does Erica have? A uh, trick question. Unless it's Boston during the Retributionary War, nobody has any guests. Besides, who would go to a tea party nowadays with so many arcades? Plus, if it's like when mom drinks tea, they're gonna go broke just buying the bourbon. <laughs> Seven. Marshall has a secret and tells Julie. There are 90 students in their school. If Julie tells one student a day, and each student she tells tells one student a day, who has not been told, how many days before the entire school knows Marshall's secret? Well, once they tell Sarah Peterson, pretty much 25 minutes. <laughs> when Kevin McDonald put his hand under Abigail Walter's dress at the spring dance, it only took a half hour before they canceled the dance, and now Abigail has to go to church three times a week, and Kevin can't go to the field trip to the zoo. So I guess the answer is Julie is a gossip and someone should put a frog in her backpack. Now my favorite parts of these is I always put teacher comments in. Robert either has a very active imagination or should be in foster care. <laughs> Please forward this to the school counselor, Miss Abernathy, Miss Sanford. I would rather resign than spend another hour with Bobby. <laughs> The last time I had him in my office, he drew Godzilla fighting zombies on my desk in permanent marker, and the school refuses to replace it. So that's that one. Now, are, are there any writers in the audience? No? Okay, so you guys have real jobs? You are a writer? What is your real job? Uh, so, uh, so it's, it's difficult to be a writer, and so I've, uh, I put together a handy uh, thing in my schedule so everyone can kind of learn the process. Uh, this is called How to Become a Writer. Being a writer of my caliber takes hard work and dedication few have. I spend literally dozens of minutes a day writing, and sometimes these aren't even homophobic comments on YouTube. I try not to let myself get pigeonholed. If you can't find time to write, you have to make time to do it. You have to work hard. Read and learn from my schedule. 10.30 a.m. Wake up, drink a full bottle of water, and take two aspirin. Go back to sleep. 11.45. Wake up again. 11.46. Masturbate. 11.47. Wake up, hooker. 12.15. Lead hooker out of the house with a trail of Xanax, Xanax ending in a cab. 12.16, write a poem that I hope will sound soulful enough to trick a woman into having free intercourse with me. 12.20, break time, smoke 20 cigarettes, you've earned it. 12.59, attempt to start a poem again, take call from hospital, re-hooker with Xanax overdose. 1.09 p.m., drive to the hospital to pick up stolen wallet. 1.26 p.m., pick up wallet at front desk. 1.28 p.m., smother hooker with pillow. 1.59 p.m., back to that poem. Boy, I use a fuckload of semicolons. 2.04 p.m., that took a lot out of me. I could use a nap. 4.26 p.m., wake, wake up to a knock at the door. See hooker's pimp. Hide in the backyard till he goes away. 4.27 p.m., holy shit, I left beer out here? 7.29 p.m. Why was I back here again? Stagger back inside. 7.31 p.m. Inventory, everything stolen. 8.40 p.m. Drive to Kinko's to use a computer to finish poem. 8.59 p.m. Oh my god, I forgot Kinko's was next to an arcade! 12.01 a.m. These are open 24 hours a day, right? Not this one, apparently. Fucking cheese and Ryu. You have to play a lot of Street Fighter to get that. 12.05 uh, <laughs> a.m., fourth meal, or 11 Z's if you speak Hobbit. 1.30 a.m., I guess I could use paper. 1.41 a.m., seriously, like if I got a piece of paper right now, I could finish this poem. 1.52 a.m., I found some paper. You know what else I could use this paper for? 4.01 a.m., 4.02 p.m., fall asleep on the living room floor. 4.45 a.m., wake up, vomit, finish poem.
All right, so I'm going to do one that's a, that's a little less humorous, um, but uh, I don't know how many people here are into astronomy and that stuff. Um, do, it, does anybody else miss Pluto? Okay, all right, then you guys will be into this. This is called Thoughts on Pluto. Does anyone else miss Pluto? Seriously, I do. My very educated mother just served us nine. Nine what? Without Pluto, the mnemonic device just leaves us hanging. Pluto will always be a planet to me. I mean, it was like the, Pluto was the kid who was picked last on the soccer team and then kicked off the team later because everyone found out he had a club foot. True. Not everyone can be planets. Also true. I get that if Pluto counts, then we have like 13 planets. But seriously, can we let this one slide? Have we ever been hurt by having too many planets? Unless, you know, like, they hit us or something. Uh, I didn't feel, I feel like we didn't invite Pluto to our sleepover, and everybody knows it. I imagine Pluto lonely. He sits outside the house holding a wrapped birthday present that he bought in advance when he thought he was going to be invited. He wears a small party hat. Through the window, he watches Venus and Saturn grind in front of the stereo. <laughs> Mercury doing his class clown routine. Mars starting a fight with some guy named Aries, and no one's quite sure why. Insert your anus joke here. <laughs> Thanks, Mikey. He wants to take the present and just smash it on the ground, but it's perfect. It's just what Earth wanted, and he can't bear for her not to have it, even if she doesn't recognize him as her equal anymore. He sets it in her, at her door and rings the doorbell. Pulling his coat up over his neck to stop the draft, he walks into the night. Don't worry, he grows up and marries Earth's best friend, Luna. Two moons can live quite happily together. Pluto had it coming, you say? Totally. Look how it was orbiting, practically asking for it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, in this post-neoplanetist society, an interstellar body can and should orbit in any way that makes it feel sexy, but, and maybe I'm old-fashioned, sometimes you want to see, you just want to see a planetoid, you see a planetoid, and it's just orbiting the sun like it wants to be downgraded. But still, I do miss Pluto, and I'm glad you do too. I just hope it doesn't make him start listening to Nickelback. <laughs> Pluto, if you're reading this, we still love you. Please put down the CD. It's really, really shitty music. <laughs> Pluto, question mark, to August 24th, 2006. I'll pour 40 on the curb for you, brother. And finally, is there anyone here from Fremont? Lived here for a while. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is in the style of a tall tale. Uh, and there's a little bit of story behind this. I was once told the biggest line of bullshit about a bar fighter that I've ever heard. It wasn't this, but it was damn close. And this is the legend of Django Stevens. Now, years ago, in the little town of Fremont, Nebraska, where the pleasant aroma of the hog-rendering plant blankets the city in its sweet perfume, and the wind doesn't blow, it sucks, lived the greatest warrior the world had ever seen. His Christian name was Django Stevens. Nine feet tall he was, with biceps like kegs of Pap's blue ribbon, and legs so powerful he could tip cows two at a time. During the daylight hours, majestic in his flannel shirt and Peterbilt hat, he spent his days at the meatpacking plant, stunning cows not with an air hammer, but with the power of his glare alone. <laughs> but when the day ended and the moon was high in the sky, Django Stevens would comb back his mullet just so, slip on his biggest, shiniest belt buckle, and drive down to Scooter's Pub. There he was the drinkingest, fightingest man the town had ever seen. He'd fight men six at a time, they'd say, until the wee hours when he would retire to his glorious double wide with the waitress of his choice and celebrate victory until dawn. Such was his life until one fateful night. There he stood upon a pile of unconscious men, enjoying a dip of fine Copenhagen chewing tobacco and a cold tall boy of American Pilsner. He was considering calling the police on himself just so he'd have someone to punch out when the door to the pub exploded into splinters. There, resplendent in a rhinestone bedazzled karate key, the gel making his hair shine like the surface of the sun, stood Steven Seagal. <laughs> I 
reckon that boy's gonna stomp you? Said one of the pile through a mouthful of bloody teeth. Django said nothing. He finished his tall boy in one mighty swig, spit his chewing tobacco out under the floor, and cracked his knuckles. Now when old Django Stevens cracked his knuckles, all across Fremont, the men would cower and the women would ovulate. <laughs> but Seagal never moved. I'm a seventh Don and a keto, Seagal said as Django squared up. And I got a seventh Don and whoopin' ass, Django required, replied. Now those who were there that fateful night say that Stigall tried to punch him, but when Django reached his arm back so far that when the punch came, it had a Texas postmark on the knuckles. Folks say that Stigall exploded into a pile of blood and hair, but I have it on good authority that NASA scientists have seen him in the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting Jupiter. Now as Django was wiping his hair gel from his knuckles, who should rush out of the shadows but the Incredible Hulk? Django saw him, but before you know it, damned if Django didn't use his expert high school wrestling moves to twist the Hulk up into a balloon animal that he gave to a passing child. <laughs> then he struck the child unconscious, as was his way. <laughs> By then, every filly in Fremont was there, each one eager and willing to sire Django's heir. He was so busy checking these delicate blossoms for open sores and missing teeth that he nearly missed the Chicago Bears sneaking up from behind him, each and every one carrying a rusty lawn dart. <laughs> Django turned and let out a bellow that would turn a gay man straight, a straight man gay, and a bi-curious man one way or the other and rushed headlong into the fray. <laughs> Legend has it that the ruckus was so loud the police were taking complaints all the way in Oriental China. Well, it was about that time that Django was growing weary at tussling with mere mortals. Smashing a beer bottle over the head of the final Chicago bear, Django Stevens uttered his famous last words. I'ma go knock Jehovah the fuck out. He ain't better than me, he said, then jammed the beer bottle right into his throat. The fourth with which his spirit left his mortal shell washed the running boards of every truck in Fremont, if legends can be believed. Now, nobody knows if old Django knocked out Yahweh but we do know that the very next day, President George Walker Bush became 43rd president of these United States. <laughs> Folks around these parts say if you listen just right, you can hear old Django's voice on the wind cussing at his common-law wife to make him some dinner. They say he'll come back one day when the town is threatened and wings are six for a dollar and retake his rightful place as the emperor of Fremont. Thanks for coming out, support the charity. I have to admit, after a couple of beers and uh, a couple of shots of whiskey that Travis was kind enough to buy me, I'm always a little dodgy about going up a flight of stairs onto a stage. I'm always expecting to have my Dean Martin moment or something. And so with that in mind, I'm going to introduce the gentleman who was kind enough to buy me a couple of shots of Black Bush earlier. Uh, in this case, I'm speaking of the Irish whiskey Bush Mills variety. Uh, the gentleman's name is Travis Hearman. Uh, unlike, sorry, unlike Will, he is actually an honest to God writer and a brilliant one at that. And we've been really glad to have him with us. So Travis, please come up and join us. Good evening, everyone. I don't know, can you, can you even see that thing behind me? Oh, I'll read it to you in a second. Uh, first of all, I want to encourage you all to go give money to those kind folks back there in the back of the room. Otherwise, I don't get to listen to Garrison Keillor anymore. Yeah. Uh, so please do. And I've also, I've also have some uh, books of my own back there on the table. Uh, and all proceeds tonight, if you go back and buy one, uh, go to KIOS. Uh, so go buy a book, come find me, I'll sign it for you. Uh, I've got some novels and a couple of anthologies back there with stories of mine in it. Okay, so in case you can't read that, um, it's, I saw this on Facebook a while back. It says, ladies, guys are sick of hearing you ask where all of the nice guys are. They're in the friend zone where you left them. All right, so anybody in here ever been friend zoned? Yeah, uh, nice guys in here, yeah? Okay, um, the thing is, is that, is that this is completely unfair. Uh, it places all the blame on women for not recognizing the greatness of that nice guy, when in fact, 
I don't know, adjust this too. All right, anyway. When in fact, what she really wants uh, from him is to be the man who will sweep her off her feet, make her all moist and swoony, not act like it, not pretend to be that, but to be that guy. So for all of you bereft and resentful nice guys out there, fuck you, quit whining, and it's time to change your game. It's not because women like jerks. Women prefer polite over rude and attentive over distracted. The problem is the way the nice guys present these positive characteristics. In order to appear friendly and romantic, these nice guys think they have to turn off their sexuality. They hide their desires in order not to offend, presenting an androgynous, asexual persona. The first impression they give is one of emasculation, weakness, and lack of desire. At best, they confuse the woman as whether they even find her attractive. That's what jerks offer women that nice guys don't. They are not afraid to be sexual. This is a quote from Tony Klink, the lay guy. I met Patty on the day I graduated from high school when she came through the receiving line and shook my hand. I had seen her around the network of small Nebraska and South Dakota towns that represented our meager pool of Saturday night entertainment venues. Honey blonde hair and big blue green eyes with an impish smile and the kind of body that would bring any 17 year old boy to a screeching halt at 100 yards. Uh, I, still remember feel the, I still remember the feeling of her hand in mine, cool and silky. The sound of her quiet, careful voice, ready to laugh, ready to play. From the day we met and for about three years afterward, I thought about her every day and all the ways that a kid in love thinks of someone. What is she doing now? What if I... Mm, you know, it would be so cool to show her, mm, maybe if I ask her to, mm, infinite scenarios and ideas and second guesses, all melding into a thick corn-fed mash in my skull. Maybe it's just not kids who do this. We connected briefly once, leaning against the side of my car, trying to kiss each other like we knew how. Fireworks exploding behind my eyelids because this girl that I had liked for months was right there with me, by God, me until some jackass happened by and broke things up. But I couldn't make it happen again because here's the nemesis of so many guys, the thing that keeps them up at night bitching to their buddies and crying in their beer every, at home every Saturday night in preparation for their romantic moment with a nice lubricant. <laughs> she was in love with the bad boy who would break her heart over and over. Jerk, idiot, how many times did I stomp around and whine this dumbass is better than me? Are you kidding me? And yes, I'm old. We didn't have the phrase douchebag back then. <laughs> Familiar story? Here's another, here's another chief characteristic of this story. For a time, I played the role of her emotional maxi pad. The friend to whom she would confide the folly of her commonsensically challenged boyfriend. The friend who wrote letters to her every week for three years, none of which included how I really felt. I was the guy who went, she went to for intelligent conversation, for real friendship, the nice guy, the friend, the guy who didn't make her heart beat faster. Then I started dating her sister, but that's another story. <laughs> and the moral of that story is, never tell the girl you're dating that you're kind of in love with her sister. That was a shitty date. Anyway. In college, I finally had a real shot with her. She and another female friend drove 400 miles to visit me. My roommates and I had a party, like we did every night. Two of my friends hit on her and were rebuffed. When the time came to call an end to the evening, our mutual female friend was off making out with somebody, and I offered Patty my bed to sleep in, all platonically, of course. She had gone into my room, and I knocked one last time. She opened the door with her shirt unbuttoned. I asked her if she needed anything. She looked at me for a moment and said, no, and I closed the door. Oh. Why? <laughs> How many times in the last two decades have I kicked myself for simply not taking the shot? Well, every strand of DNA in my body wanted to join her there in my own bed, I couldn't take the shot. I rationalized it a dozen different ways. She has a boyfriend. I'm a gentleman. But what, but what it boiled down to is that I was so terrified of rejection that I simply did nothing. This is the curse of the nice guy. 
The ridiculous irony is that in retrospect, I could have probably walked in there, taken her in my arms, and my life would have taken a different path. I have good taste in women. I am not saying this to sound arrogant. How many friends have you had whose standards in love, sex, relationships were sketchy at best? The, the anything that moves standard is more common for men than for women perhaps, but it does go both ways. The drink until I'm cute crowd. The quick score, the easy hookup, one wink across a crowded room and the next thing you know you're making out in a darkened corner or waking up the next morning thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Oh Jesus, what was I thinking? Or perhaps you're lying next to an arm that has already been gnawed off. <laughs> Once upon a time, my taste was like a wine connoisseur fresh from the unemployment office who walks into the wine shop with five bucks, is mesmerized, enraptured by all these racks, these, these rare, exquisite vintages. He picks one that he knows will be amazing, feels his heart beat faster, imagines the feel of it on his lips, the taste on his tongue, the scent in his nose, and then sees the price tag. All he can do is shrug and leave empty-handed or else he buys the Thunderbird. <laughs> how many people find that great love we seem to yearn for? Uh, and how many settle for someone who is merely settling for someone who will have them? Eh, you'll do. Why does one person find their way into your heart, into your mind, under your skin, stoking that furnace right behind your groin, and another, perhaps smarter, more beautiful, more charming, does not? Why does someone who likes you not always cause your butterflies to take off in great flights of fluttering chaos. Studies say people of about the same level of physical attractiveness tend to end up together, but what does this mean? People of Walmart shopping for 4XL t-shirts and spandex tights on sale? Brad and Angelina strutting together down Rodeo Drive with clothes on their bodies that would cost me a year's pay? Joe and Jill Average rooted on the couch together watching American Idol while he thinks about his golf game and she's imagining being bent over the couch like a porn star and he's lost any sense of how to do that. Is it a soulmate's thing? Do you recognize the other person at the spiritual level and it manifests in the physical world or is it just a ridiculous attempt to lend supernatural significance to the ineffable, the invisible but powerful jets of spreading hormones, testosterone and estrogen, vasopressin, adrenaline, oxytocin, and dopamine. These, that create these feelings of excitement, then attraction, then connection, then lust, then attachment, then fulfillment, then detachment, then longing, then heartbreak. All these stages of what we call love. The recipe for me is unique to me, and we have dozens of unique recipes in this room, all of you with your unique recipes. And one person's recipe is seasoned by the other person, like another chef stepping in to create a 10-course feast, or maybe just one succulent meal, or maybe just one decadent dessert. All it takes to set a spark to the fuse is one long moment of eye contact. All it takes to launch that storm of hormones is an orgasm. Casual sex is never really as casual as we like to think. It falls to the man to make that attempt to cross the greatest distance in the history of humankind, that last five inches between your lips and hers. Because women will wait a lifetime for the man to have the guts to act. Besides, attractive women are hit on, either directly or indirectly, depending on her locale, maybe dozens of times in a single day. She has options. Women with options don't need to have sex with their best friends. Of course, I'm overgeneralizing. Yes, there are women who know what they want, and they seize it, or else they leave a trail of breadcrumbs clear enough for even the most dim-witted nice guy to follow. <laughs> and many times, the man is quite happy, relieved, in fact, to find a woman who doesn't mind smacking him upside the head with a two-by-four saying, enough vacillating shithead, pay attention. Which is, of course, how I ended up with my future ex-wife. Sick to death of pining, tired of being endlessly relegated to the relationship wasteland labeled friend, where nothing grows or thickens except frustration, and the only body heat to be felt is the humiliation hanging around my ears that I somehow didn't make the grade, I encountered a woman who chose me. When Cheryl hit me in the head with an emotional two-by-four, I was more than happy to go along. 
If not for her, who knows how long I might have pined away for that girl who didn't quite like me enough. I didn't have to take the shot. I had already been slam dunked. Those early years were like 1.21 gigawatts of juice flowing through and setting every nerve ending on fire. But like Dr. Emmett Brown says, the only power source capable of generating 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. And what happens when something is struck by lightning? It ain't pretty. The nice guyness contributed to why the relationship failed. I allowed all of my own desires uh, and needs to be relegated to secondary importance. Just be the good guy. Be nice to your wife. She has lots of issues. Help her with them. Never argue. Let's just let things slide. One result was that she lost all respect for me. Another was that I lost all respect for myself. The biggest symptom of, of the disease that relationship had become appeared when I realized I was in love with someone else. A lovely little Canadian woman with a, bright, with a smile that could light up a stadium and signal orbiting spacecraft. Even though I never acted on those feelings, recognizing that simple fact, I'm in love with Marin, was the catalyst that ultimately led me to dissolve a hopelessly fractured marriage. I never acted on those feelings for Marin, but she knew, and at first opportunity she ran like a scalded cat, and I don't blame her. I was a mess. Uh, I was the nice guy with her too. Always ready to help her do things for her. She could have asked me for one of the moons of Saturn, and I'd have tried to get it. And I would never, ever, no matter how often I thought about it, try to kiss her. The Marin debacle was a consequence of scraping away the soot and cinders that the lightning strike, after the lightning strike, and finding myself trapped in a relationship that turned Cheryl and I into twisted, warped doppelgangers of our original selves, the stumps of blackened trees that had once intertwined. The symptom of a profound unease with who I had become, of being miserable without ever being without being able to admit why. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to seven minutes. Seven minutes, you're good. Okay. There are two other names between then and now, both of them learning experiences. If one could call evisceration with a cheese knife a learning experience. <laughs> You like someone, you think she's gorgeous, brilliant, sweet, funny, you want to get to know her, you make your feelings known, subtly this time, subtly. And she's kind of ex supposed to like you back. Note to nice guys out there, don't try to blow her mind with romance until she's, ready, until she's already on board. Uh, it sets off alarm klaxons akin to, torpedo in the water, dive, dive, dive. <laughs> and she heads nose down for the depths where you can't reach her and just waits for you to quit circling. Kimiko's family name means wisteria blossoms, those delicate spring flowers that explode from their vines in fragrant lavender cascades. She was a quintessential Japanese woman, cultured, polite, quiet, kind, with alabaster skin and fine, delicate features, uh, not to mention a keen intelligence and a, a contagious passion for teaching. We worked together for nine months, and in this case, um, even a dumbass, the dumbass that I was then, knew that it was on. Um, a few, um, we worked together for nine months. When that time was up and we could finally date, we went out together twice and had fun, at least from my perspective. But sheer nervousness turned me into some sort of baboon manatee hybrid. <laughs> I gave her things. I tried to be romant. I tried to be romantic. Uh, I tried way too hard. And all that attraction and rapport just turned cold like sake left in the jar. Even with my soul crushed, though, I sensed a pattern. I didn't know what, but I was doing something wrong. From that point, I launched a research, blitz, a research blitzkrieg. Seminars by dating gurus, books on seduction, gender dynamics, social dynamics, biology, psychology, pickup artists, experts of both genders. I even read a couple of romance novels. <laughs> And boys, if you are utterly befuddled and really want to know how women think, the romance novel is like reading the other team's playbook. <laughs> I wanted the answers to the big questions of human existence, romance, and who boinks whom. The answer was not 42. Why do some people get together and others don't? How does attraction work? Let's just say I identified my problem. Nice guy, noun phrase. A man who supplicates himself to women, does things for them, is the faithful friend, is terrified of scaring them off. A man who gives them gifts is unfailingly, overly friendly. 
all in the hopes that some woman will chance, him, chance to like him enough that he'll get laid. But he never does. Or if he does, it is purely by accident and with a woman he's not that into. Definition two. Descriptive phrase often used by women in reference to a man with whom they have no intention of ever having sex. So, too much nice guy. The nice guy doesn't realize that he's shooting himself in the foot at every turn. He doesn't have the courage to risk failure. He therefore becomes asexual around women to whom he's attracted and does everything he can to become her friend in hopes that she'll like him that way. He thinks he's getting closer to what he wants, but exactly the reverse is happening. All he's doing is getting closer to the barbed wire fence or erected around some of the parts he's most interested in. If he does, finally, build himself up enough to make that ultimate move, the woman's response is almost always the just friends kung fu block technique. And what she's actually feeling in that moment is utterly incomprehensible to him. She has become emotionally invested in friendship too and feels betrayed, deceived. You became friends with me just to get my pants. Even if she had been attracted to him at some point, his nice guy behavior had long ago soaked her interest in a cold shower. For whatever reason, having already compartmentalized him as friends, she slams on the brakes and he goes flying through the windshield. But that ingrained behavior doesn't die so easily. In those larval days of my heroic quest to reinvent myself, my world was rocked by the woman who became the most recent debacle. I cannot recall ever being so utterly, literally stunned by beauty, intelligence, insight in a single package. This one topped them all. The kind of woman who inspires art, ballads, stories, and enough bad poetry to choke Byron. <laughs> I was rendered dumb on numerous occasions just by looking her in the eye. By this time, the nice guy behavior was thoroughly, thoroughly identified and tasered into drilling submission. <laughs> I took the shot with her immediately, and she responded with enough favor and friendliness to keep me coming back, but withholding enough to take physical steps. Then lunch, you know, one conversation over coffee, and I was done for. Then lunch, a few drinks, a movie that felt to me like a first date, and other activities over the course of a couple of years, all with me crossing my fingers and sacrificing feral cats to the great old ones that I not fuck this up. <laughs> Just kidding about crossing my fingers. I'm not a superstitious guy. <laughs> and by the way, that's another of the great par paradoxes of this game. The probability distribution of your chance of success asymptotically approaches zero the more you care about the outcome. The more it matters, the greater your chance to fuck it up. Flooded by schoolboy thoughts, deafened by a heart pounding a little too loud, I didn't realize then that her reality was a whole different dimension where the laws of physics weren't the same as mine. And the nice guy was not quite done. He managed a couple of last spasms of stupidity. I should have shot myself in the foot with a large bore firearm as a helpful distraction, rather than telling her how I felt, because that's one of the no-nos that the naturals and dating experts already know, however counterintuitive it might be. Never tell the woman how you feel until well after you've closed the deal. Unless you've gotten on base a couple of times, scored a run or two, okay, then. So without even a kiss between us to back me up, I spilled it like I'd been waterboarded. Without hesitation, she dropped the doomsday F-bomb. I saw it coming, slim pickings, waving his cowboy hat the whole way down, straddling that weapon of mass destruction with friend between his legs. As part of the detonation and chain reaction, she accused me of treating her like a future conquest. Oh, the irony. <laughs> I guess being placed in the cat player category rather than the friend compartment was not unflattering, but it was not productive. Um, I carried that torch the longest of anyone since debacle number one. In a stupendous feat of masochism and cruelty, I made her do this a couple of more times. It's always better to nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. <laughs> a constant undercurrent of thoughts throughout that period. Why her? Why not that one? Or that one? Endless spirals of if. If only she actually knew me, rather than tainting her perceptions of me by the sins of others. If only my infatuation had allowed me to see that her perception of me did not match mine. If only I had realized it was blinding me to the deep disconnect prevalent in many of our interactions. If only I could have recognized the hectares of emotional distance with which she surrounded herself, in spite of appearances to the contrary. 
and that that distance was a no man's land, fraught with landmines planted during the ramp planted during the rampages of damaged men who had been there before me. Remember those douchebags I mentioned before? They're everywhere, and some of them are worse than others. Then again, this is just how I saw it. For all I know, none of this is true, and she just didn't, she just didn't like how I look, or how I smell, or how I sound, or any of those thousand tiny, those tiny unconscious judgments we make when we're auditioning for the sack. Maybe I was so determined not to be friend-zoned again that I was blind to the possibility she might have needed that first. Or maybe I was just a dumbstruck, gobsmacked, blithering idiot one too many times. So the radioactive scar, the radioactive crater became a scar that I hope turns white someday, and I still sense the slivers of plutonium down there buried too deep to reach. The heart is a messy place, but I took the shot. The shot landed somewhere in no man's land, defeated by triple redundant emotional countermeasures. Nice guys either don't take the shot or they wait too long. Thus, they are breeding themselves out of the gene pool or left to flounder and splash around in the shallow end waiting for some woman to throw them water wings. Because, deep down, in its darkest, moistest, stickiest core, that's what it's all about, isn't it? For men, it's, will she let me put my thing in her thing and what do I have to do to make that happen? For her, it's, if I let him stick his thing in my thing, will he stick around long enough to raise the baby and can he kill a mammoth? With this last one, I was just a peewee leaguer trying to pinch it for the Yankees, and I made some miscues in my, uh, along the way as my worldview was undergoing cosmic realignment. Uh, but it's all part of the journey. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Nice guys believe they must supplicate. Oh, please, I'll buy you an expensive dinner if you let me touch your boobies. <laughs> but permission is never, ever given. Surrender is sexy. Permission is not. And some stories are still being written. I still have excellent taste. These days, however, I don't go into a wine shop without the knowledge that I have an unlimited budget and the willingness to use it. I was introduced to an attractive woman a while back who said to me, you look like a nice guy. I said, it's a good cover. I'm not really. She gave me a little smile and a nod. So, you're just behaving then. I gave her a little smile back. Indeed. I'm emceeing the show tonight. I'm sure you've seen some people. By the way, we have an internet feed. Should you not want to go out on a Monday night for whatever reason, uh, check out our website, samuraispokenword.com. And I'm not talking to you. Uh, so anyway, um, we, we need to talk to each other a bit more often. I know I'm always doing the looking for pornography thing or gaming a lot, but eventually we will talk, I promise. In the meantime, there's a gentleman coming up here. Um, you know that person in your life you always hear about for about two, three years? Yeah, this is, dude, you're really going to like him. You, you, you guys are really similar, except he has talent. <laughs> but you, you'll really get along. It'll be great. It'll be cool. And then I'm sitting there going, I'm still remembering everything except the he's really cool, you'll get along. All I'm remembering is the he has talent and you suck. And then I met him and I went, fuck, they're right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Christopher Wake. So, uh, tonight, I thought about telling these particular stories and then ending it with the punchline, but I think I will tell you the punchline first to avoid some of the shock and awe. I'm going to... What's that? Okay. I am going to talk... I'm going to actually make some jokes and talk about the Down Syndrome today. Yeah, see? Shock. Aw. Aw. But it's not... Yes, but it's not in the way that you think. My youngest brother has Down Syndrome, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. 
Uh, recently, there was a, a Facebook group that was created by somebody named Misty Erickson, who's in this crowd right now, that started sort of a joke thing called the official fan club of Chris Wig. And, <laughs> ah, you heard. Ah. And I thought that it was really funny. It actually kind of set me off. I was laughing pretty hard, and this happened on Saturday. And I thought uh, one of the things I had said to Misty was thank you, because she sort of attends about everything that I've done when she hears about it. And I thought, that's a real big fan. But I'm going to tell you about my number one fan, and that's my youngest uh, brother, who was born in 1979. And I'm going to skip all of those years and just start telling you some of the funny ones. Um, and I'll pull from my card here. Uh, when I got married, my wife <coughs> pulled out like a large scroll kind of thing, and she read her vows. And then it came to me, and I pulled out like a three by five card that said like, vow now, brown cow, on one <laughs> side of it. <laughs> sort of feels like that. <laughs> uh, so my brother is the largest wrestling fan you could know, and it kind of makes Mikey even look like a fanboy compared to what my brother is. Right? He starts most conversations whenever I meet him with, good news! And I said, what, what's going on? So-and-so has the heavyweight champion belt. And I'm like, oh, great. It's like, good news, so-and-so won this match. And it drives him. It drives him very much. His, he's almost autistic in some ways, and I keep telling and reminding him, you're not autistic, you have Down syndrome. So you don't have to live off of this exact schedule. You don't have to buy your underwear at Kmart, that kind of stuff. But one time, wrestling had come to Omaha, and so as a treat, my father had actually was working for a company, had scored box seats at, at the Quest Center, which is now the CenturyLink. And uh, he said, take your brother. And so I went and I picked him up. And my mom says to us, and specifically to him, she was like, Nick, no swearing. You need to take down the swearing. Mind you, the man's like 29 years old, right? So we get in the car, and it's just he and I driving. And I said, it's OK, dude. Let it out double barrel, let's swear all day. And so he kind of gets giddy. And I said, well, what do you think of this wrestler? And he says, well, I don't really like that wrestler. And I said, oh, you don't? He's like, no, he's an asshole. <laughs> and then he kind of looks around. And he's waiting for him to be scolded. And it doesn't happen. And I said, OK. And then we're sort of talking. And he was like, you know what you are? And I said, well, he's like, you're an asshole. <laughs> And suddenly, he starts to develop Tourette's. <laughs> and everything's an asshole. And this is the only really word that he's just punching on. And I said to him, <laughs> we get about 10 minutes more down the road, and I look at him and I said, you know what you're kind of being like? And he's like, no, what? And I said, you're being like an asshole. <laughs> and he gets this serious look, and he says, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> Let's not do this. <laughs> I said, uh, I apologize. Uh, no worries. So that night, uh, the, the thing I've left out was his home haircut. Um, it's unfortunate enough, but he had a haircut that was kind of cut bangs in the front like this. Uh, and then long in the back, and if you remember, there was a marketing campaign like on, uh, what was it, like Skittles, Starburst, what was it, Sean? Uh, where it was like an English fop who, who sang the song, Berries and Cream, Berries and Cream. <laughs> I'm a little lad who loves berries and cream. And so, you can see Sean's having a heart attack. Uh, and so that was the theme that night, was anytime he wanted to do anything, I said, sing the song. And, and he would do a little performance and whatever. And then eventually he was like, you're an asshole. <laughs> so wrestling was had. It was a great and grand time. And that night, we're driving back. And we stop at a Burger King. And we're in the lot. And we went through a drive-through. They missed something. Sean went inside because he was with us. 
and we're sitting in the parking lot, and my brother looks over to the side, and in the car that's next to us is Dusty Rhodes, who's also at a Burger King. What a reaction out there, probably from Mikey. And uh, it was this awesome moment where he like looks over, and then he looks back, and then like, what? And then he looks back, and then Dusty and him make eye contact, and Dusty says, yeah. And all of a sudden, our windows are rolled up. Poor Dusty saw this guy about blow up in the other car because it just became silent screaming, like. <laughs> <laughs> and the decibel went to like 40. Uh, it was just utterly amazing. It blew him away. It was his night. Like, he just absolutely loved that. And that's the thing about him, is that growing up, I realized that, and this is his character. This has nothing to do with his disability or anything. This is just the way he is. He appreciates the simplicity of the moment or anything, and he fully embraces it. Another friend of mine, Sean, did some wrestling locally here, and I took Nick to go watch it, and when he walked out, Nick recognized him and just was like full out passion, and it basically just made him break character. Um, he just sort of crippled him. You can see him right now, he's kind of getting crippled even me talking about it. Let me tell you about Michael Jackson. <laughs> so my brother loves Michael Jackson and is obsessed. Um, as a kid growing up, I was probably 14, 15 years old at this time, and I would come home and then he would come uh, home like we were latchkey at the time, and then he would go straight to his room and throw on some music and then practice his moves. And I got so tired of hearing Smooth Criminal. <laughs> it was every day, and at that time it was a tape player, so it would, he would finish whatever it was, then you hear <laughs> and then it would go back to the thing, and then <laughs> and go back, and then you go in and he would just be like, absolute beaded, full out sweat, like he had been jumping rope in the attic, kind of like, just total, whatever. So I said to him, I was like, can we listen to anything different today? And he was like, uh-uh. And I said, please, just anything. And he was like, no. So I walked away from it, and I hear it again. Goes back and smooth criminal. And it's just going back and forth, back and forth. And I fucking couldn't take it anymore. And I went in there and I just ejected the tape. And he was like, no. And I took it and I went out to my backyard and I threw that motherfucker to the moon. It's there. And as I threw it as hard as I could, and I've got an arm. I could just hear him like, no, and that thing was gone. Somewhere in the deep parts of my heart, I had destroyed something that I shouldn't have, and I felt really bad. And so I wound up getting him a CD, which was the anthology of Michael Jackson. And in his CD player, there was no more, it was just instant rewind. Later, these skills would be developed when he would attend weddings, and most pronounced was my wedding, where we were having a grand old time, and all of a sudden, somebody put Thriller on, and he was like, clear. <laughs> and he got out there and just 100% knew the choreography, and just <laughs> nailed it, and everybody just backed off, like, what is going on here? <laughs> So, later in life, that movie came out, that Michael Jackson movie, and I decided to take him to it. And we went on opening weekend, and I said to him, there's a few rules that we need to discuss. <laughs> the first, we can't sing at this movie. <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of people here. The second, we cannot shriek every time Michael gets on the screen, <laughs> because that will be two hours of shrieking. The third is that there is no dancing. You need to stay in your seat. So the movie begins, and lo and behold, Michael comes out, and you could see the reaction as he wants to start to do the dance and start to sing, but he maintains. And instead, he starts looking at me. 
In that way that if you're with somebody and they've watched something that they think is entertaining or funny and they keep looking at you for your approval as it's happening, this is what he did. So we were sitting and looking at here and he keeps, Michael walks out, boom. <laughs> Two hours. I thought for sure I'd have to take him to the chiropractor. <clears throat> it was amazing. My brother's the kind of guy who will tangle his controllers on his Nintendo or his game system to the point of ridiculous where he's playing one inch from the television. Where he can't pull anything out because it will shut the television off or turn off the game. He's the kind of man who can tangle the cords on a wireless controller. <laughs> My brother loves Britney Spears. <laughs> Aw, exactly. My brother can't say the word, the clapper. <laughs> It's most enjoyable when he sings the song, clap on, clap off, clap on, clap off, the clap, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he does that for me when I'm feeling down. <laughs> My brother's the kind of man that will put nacho cheese on anything. <laughs> Corn flakes. <laughs> Popcorn, whatever. You mention it, he would do it if you would allow him to. Many years ago, uh, my friend Damon worked at a tobacco store, a cigar store, and he brought over some cigars, and we were outside, I was probably about 19 years old, and I was smoking a cigar, and my brother saw me, and he comes running out of the house, pissed off, and he's like, what are you doing? Smoking is terrible. I can't believe you're doing this. Now let me pause and tell you about my father before I give you that punchline. When I first bought a motorcycle many years ago, I went from the, the house that I bought it from. I never had driven a motorcycle, and I just learned on the fly, and I drove it to my father's house, and I said, look what I have. And my dad comes running out of the house, and he was like, what? What are you doing? You don't have a driver's license for a motorcycle. You don't have insurance. You've never driven one of these. These are dangerous. You could kill yourself. I said, do you want to ride it? And he was like, yes. <laughs> Nick comes running out, what are you doing? You're smoking, smoking's horrible for you. I've seen all these ads, you shouldn't be doing this. You could, you could get sick, you shouldn't do this. I said, do you want to try this? Yes. <laughs> so I gave my brother a cigar. Uh, my mother who's watching this right now actually <laughs> doesn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he, he, he put it in his mouth and he actually blew out of it, he didn't inhale. And he had this look about him that was just total resolve, where he, he was like, yes, this is a good cigar. <laughs> I actually, and I'm gonna share with you something I wrote at that time, this is when I was 19, um, an accelerated rush of confusion and disappointment turned table when the duo handed over the brown paper. At first awkward to the hold, then only changed and arranged by the pair of wiser companions. Half smile in hand, the two waited breathless, only to see an inexperienced exhale, followed by what would seem years of an electronic prison temporarily lifted to share the one bond that lifted away in the gray smoke. Thank you. So my last Nick story that I will tell you tonight was when I was first dating my wife, um, we decided to go on a double date because there was this girl that he was interested in that wasn't Britney Spears. And uh, her name was Deborah. She also had Down syndrome. Whew. Yatch! 
And uh, we went and saw a movie, and the movie was about to start, and they were about three rows in front of us. And as the, the trailers had ended, he turned, um, or she turned to him and said something, and then he was like, I, I, don't, I don't know. And then she got irate, and then he was like, okay, one second, one second. And then he got up and he came back to me, and he's like, dude, we gotta go. And I said, what, the movie hasn't even started yet? And he's like, yeah, um, you see, Baywatch is gonna start, and Deborah wants to watch that. And I was like, well, her because we're gonna watch the movie instead. So uh, my poor brother uh, didn't, well, he told her that and she moved about four seats down and then was pissed at him for about two hours. Um, yeah, uh, thank God he didn't stay with her. Um, <laughs> she was always that way. Um, so anyways, thank you very much for your time and please. Somehow she still puts up with me, for which I'm entirely grateful. Um, and she made me do something that made me feel a little dirty in our last show. Seriously dirty, now that I think about it. She got me to read a poem, which is not my thing. Uh, and which is a shame for anybody of Irish-American descent to say, I just don't do poetry. I, or at least I didn't. And then Allison said, oh, by the way, uh, I've got this poem and it totally works for you. And I looked at it and went, fuck, she read Now, here's my enjoyment of this evening, because I'm emceeing, but I'm not really performing tonight. Uh, so this is kind of my revenge for not performing, because everybody who goes on after Allison has to follow Allison. Ladies and gentlemen, Allison, take one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Do should I what? Not to blow the out of the oh, don't blow the internet up. You don't blow the internet up. Yeah. What are all these guys gonna do on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> that was a masturbation joke. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, Hi. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, you know, I'm gonna read some poetry. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> uh. This first one is about my son, who is now two years old, but it was about the day of his birth. It's called On the Day You Were Born. On the day you were born, the earth stopped spinning, and every living creature held its breath. On the day you were born, the sun could not rise, because the moon refused to get out of the way, so intent she was on seeing the emergence of your equally round, pale head. On the day you were born, one day became one year, and no one was the right temperature, and no one could get comfortable, and everyone moaned, moved, rocked, leaned on each other to find the right place. On the day you were born, the oceans rushed inland at 1,040 miles an hour in hopes of a better view. Tsunamis crashed into each other's elbows like drunken hyenas wrestling for position. Tides were finally set free, and the crests of their waves peered into our window on the hospital's fourth floor. The mountains, saturated with ocean water, raced each other toward the Great Plains, opening a scarp twice the size of the Grand Canyon. A flying comet, distracted by the event, smacked face long into Jupiter, ejecting enough mass to create an extra planet the size of Venus. On the day you were born, the Aurora Borealis trembled and hung perfectly still in the air. Earthquakes grasped their sheer forces deep into the core. Dams buckled under the pressure. Bridges buckled under the pressure. People buckled under the pressure. And in the grand mad chaos of it all, your father's eyes met mine, and all that existed was love and silence. <laughs> He's my peanut. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I don't even know what to say about this one. Um, years ago, I moved from living, I like to call it Midtown. It wasn't really Midtown, it was the hood. Um, but <laughs> I moved from Midtown out to the suburbs and I had a little bit of difficulty with the transition. So um, this is a poem that I wrote for that time in my life. It's called In Fear for My Life. I used to live in a thick brick apartment right next door to a halfway house halfway down the block. The broken pavement, leaking pipes, and cracking walls fell down into our hair, our showers, our beds. Cockroaches ruled the kitchens, and feral cats stalked back alleys with the ferocity of cruel children. Alcoholics paced the street, drinking from paper bags, and neighbors sat on stoops, waiting to be institutionalized. Early one morning, the police showed up and put clear plastic cups over the bits of shot-out human lung lying bloody on my front steps. I lived there through four years of rent hikes, rats, and roaches, two drive-by shootings, and three break-ins. Now, I live in a beige-sided house in a beige-sided neighborhood. Everyone smiles and waves from their minivans and trucks. Roses and peonies litter the sidewalks, and perfectly trimmed lawns obey every rule. No one is shot dead in the street. I've never washed the face of a lost child. No one knocks on my door trying to sell me magazines or Jesus. No one threatens their wives in the front yard, even though the weather is warm. <laughs> No one's selling drugs from the backseat of the rusted Pontiac Sunbird. And if I leave out bags of empty soda cans for the homeless, no one picks them up before garbage day. Children laugh in the park. There are no fights to break up. And families garden together on the public grass along the boulevard. I stand in the center of the traffic-free street, staring at all of this, too terrified to move. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you guys. Okay, so the next piece is about me because, well, they gave me a stage and I'm self absorbed. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So um, <laughs> uh, it's called self possessed and it's just self explanatory. I'm not giving any introduction. Crocuda, Crocuda. It's her Latin name. She comes in striped and spotted varieties. The female has more testosterone, causing her to be larger, stronger, and more aggressive, A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E, -E, aggressive than her male counterpart. In order to mate, the male must first overcome his fear of her. Mine is extinct. Did I mention, I have a long dead hyena stuck inside me. It's a little like having a bluebird in your heart, but not. <laughs> It's not that unusual. Jim Morrison was possessed by the ghost of a dead Indian chief. Bill Hicks was regularly inhabited by the spirit of a goat god. And I have a European cave hyena lodged behind my left eye. I visit the doctor to get her out. I sit on his table while he peers into my eyes, ears, mouth. I ask him if he can see the Paleolithic cave paintings splashed across the back of my retinas. They exist there, the first human community, cuddled for warmth, doubled for strength, huddled in the rubble for connection. Can you see it? He looks at me with a blank stare. I ask to look in his eyes, ears, and mouth. He hesitates and sticks out his tongue. I can smell a man immobilized by fear of his own failure and emotionally cut off from love. <laughs> I see a psychiatrist to talk my hyena out. She asked me if I had difficulty accepting authority and how I'm feeling today, but I just can't stop laughing. <laughs> she glares at me with pursed lips over a black leather notebook, and I can taste on the air that she hasn't laughed in a long, long time. Does she still remember the scent as it bubbles up, ripening fruit on the summer breeze? I ain't a rants with a coworker over the newspaper and too much coffee. The young nurse's eyes glaze as the historical origins of American involvement in the Middle East are explained. There's a pause, and she asks, why can't you be normal? Oh. My left eye gleams under the fluorescent hospital lighting, and I reply, I am normal, not average. There's a difference. <laughs> 
because what she probably meant to say was, why are you fundamentally separated from the dominant paradigm of our society? But she didn't have the words. <laughs> Hyena isn't allowed coffee anymore. <laughs> I meet with a shaman in a last ditch effort to exercise her. He makes me sit in a musky sweat lodge. Four hours later and I've removed all my clothes and can't stop panting. Strengthened by the oppressive heat, Hyena has questions. Hyena has things she doesn't understand. Hyena demands answers while well, the shaman listens. Why do you constrain what's meant to be free? Why do you wince when rules are broken like the bones of carrion beneath my jaws? Why do you think civilization is better than a free life in the wild places? You're, you're like 200 chickens in too small a cage and one bad scare from pecking each other's eyes out. You are so separate from the world from which you evolved. Even the grassland behind your home must conform to the rigid lines of order and fences. Fences which pen you in, fences which pen you out, fences which constrain, restrain, retrain your soul to the mundane. It isn't me and my hyena, but the world that's flawed. That's why mental illness is rampant. That's why corruption's rotting away at our deals. And that's why my infant son screamed for the first six weeks of his life. He knew what he'd been born into, and he simply couldn't could not cope. The things that give your life meaning are the things you've had since the beginning of life. We need to get outdoors. Feel our feet on uneven ground. Press our fingers into soft, cool mud and paint our lover's face, neck, back. Just you and me in the solitude and comfort of the cave. We bring only our stories and our bodies and our art and that is everything. I stop to catch my breath and the shaman catches my, our eyes. He pours his lips upon mine, paints my hyena tongue with his. His bravery will be rewarded by sunrise. <laughs> So my husband's not here today, but he is awesome. And um, you know, I had some schnapps for him, so that kind of counts. <laughs> um, but I wrote this poem for him. It's called "Just Married." Isn't that sweet? Okay. I am a super villain. I dress in all black, chain smoke clove cigarettes, and drink the strongest coffee. I know everything about esoteric music no one has ever heard. I waft blasé smiles across crowded rooms. I can draw blood with the lash of my burgundy lipstick, and I speak frequently in condescending tones. That means to speak down to someone. <laughs> You're a villain too. You're moody and self-destructive. You smell deliciously of black coffee and camel non-filters. You've gotten 15 total minutes of sunshine in the last 10 years, and you know everything about physics and snakes. Our friends refer to you as a sexual Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> and you espouse hysterical rants about the Hittite civilization, carbon atoms, and the history of why everyone else is wrong. You're an unrecognized genius. We meet at a party where we're both hitting on the same girl. She backs away slowly as we rail against a world that is unfair and ruthless. All night we paint each other's naked bodies with future plans of complex schemes and fantastic devices. I carve our names into the moon with an atomic laser. You buy a secret lair for us in the Virgin Islands, which doubles as a tax shelter. <laughs> I organize an army of henchmen ready to sacrifice themselves. You create a machine that can generate devastating earthquakes, and I push the trigger every time we kiss. You steal the outer shell of an outdated nuclear weapon and put it in our living room. I refer to it as a conversation piece. <laughs> I devise an armored vest for you which generates an electric shock on command to the target of your choice. <laughs> We do not even discuss jetpacks. Jetpacks are so 2005. <laughs> I change our last names to mayhem. You build me a giant robot so I may rain terror on those who oppose us. I create a serum which bestows ultimate power at the cost of the entire universe. 
On Sunday afternoons, we'd dare each other to drink it. <laughs> we found our own secret society. We encourage our members to experiment with gamma radiation. All of our closest friends are clones, and none of our plans are ever foiled. You surprise the border guards and Juarez with knockout gas. We leave the country under a cloud of rumor and suspicion. We cling to each other's skin with the ferocity of giant spiders. I reveal my secret identity. You expose your dark secret. And we bathe together, dive deep into each other's neuroses, and jettison off at the last moment, curled in our escape pod. <laughs> So most of you guys have seen me before know that I usually do a combination of my own original stuff and then I like to do covers on occasion. I usually do covers that call to me about a person that I know. Um, and also I think that it's a good idea to just know that there are really awesome poets out there that are doing a lot of really hard work. Big Papa E is one of those poets from the 90s. I don't even think he does slam anymore because he won them all. Um, <laughs> but he's currently writing with a publishing company called Write Bloody Press. You should check out a book and maybe one day I'll get published there. Um, <laughs> and um, actually, my friend Charles is in the audience tonight. And originally, when I introduced this poem, I like to say that I've had kind of some tumultuous relationships with women, and they kind of didn't work. So there's that. And so this is for Charles, because sometimes women suck. <laughs> <laughs> This is called Neurotica. <laughs> Fuck falling in love. I am so bored with love. From now on, if I'm gonna fall at all, I wanna fall in sick. Fuck meeting for idle chit chat over coffee, doll face. Let's cut directly to the scene where we fornicate like two rabid skunks on stage in front of everybody. I'll write a poem about it called This Skank I Fucked This One Time. <laughs> to hell with caution. Let's wrap the anchor of our love around our necks and dive off the Golden Gate Bridge and strangle each other all the way down to the bottom of the San Francisco Bay until we die with our eyes open. It will be romantic <laughs> like the Titanic. Let's write epic odes to each other consisting of nothing more than the word fuck over and over again. Then let's tattoo them on our backs with the sharpened tip of a guitar string dipped in burnt styrofoam like they do in prison, which is what our relationship will be. A prison from which there is no escape. It will be just like death row, only without the anal rape. Unless you're into that sort of thing. In which case, it will be exactly like death row. I want us to file restraining orders against each other, requiring 100 yards between us at all times. And then I want us to stand at either side of a football field and glare at each other as we masturbate furiously in the end zones and shrink obscenities at each other. Oh, fuck you, you fucking fuck! Ah! I want to sue you for mental cruelty. Then I want to spend my settlement on a diamond engagement ring etched with the words, I love you, you filthy whore. <laughs> I don't want to collect a shoebox full of mementos this time. I want to stuff a casket with every lawsuit, court order, summons, and concealed weapons permit generated by this doomed relationship. And then I want to be locked inside it and buried alive with you on top of me until we die of suffocation with our eyes open, you filthy fucking whore! I want to sever all connections with everyone I know the entire time we are ruining each other's lives. And when it's finally over, I want to crawl back home on my broken fingernails, all pale and hollow-eyed, and have people wonder where the hell I've been for the last two weeks. <laughs> And I'll simply stare off into the distance and rasp the horror, the horror. Fuck love! Love hurts too fucking much. If you're gonna bother liking me at all, just fucking destroy me. Woo! <laughs> I love you, 
child. <laughs> Jesus, I need a cold shower. <laughs> Maybe two. And with that in mind, well, we're taking intermission. Ten minutes, come back, and it's going to start again.